The 80s Rewind Show Podcast. It's time to bring you yet another amazing episode. And now, welcome your host. The Face for Radio Burgess. Enjoy the show. Hello, hello, it's the 80s Rewind Show with me, Rob, the Face for Radio Burgess. And welcome along to today's episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, don't forget, if you want to email me, you can email me at the 80s Rewind Show at gmail.com. Now, that cost me 10 quid, like I told you last time, so I'm going to play it again. The 80s Rewind Show at gmail.com. So, if you want to email me and talk some 80s or just want to say hello, you can get me right there. Don't forget to check out all the other episodes as well because they're absolutely great. I'm not biased, but they are. Uh, <laughs> and um, if you can, like and subscribe. And if you could share the love and tell people about the show and, you know, the podcast and let everybody know about it, that would be amazing. Anyway, on to today's show. I've got an absolute legend for you today. Uh, Musical Youth, uh, formed in 1979, um, and around 1981-ish, uh, Dennis Seaton joined, and um, between 81 and 85, that's when they had the, uh, the golden years of Musical Youth. Um, I had a chat with Dennis today at a secret location, and uh, something was going on, and he wouldn't tell me what it was, bless him, I did press him a little bit. So it all sounds absolutely amazing. Um, it's a bit noisy on this one, um, obviously, because we was um, talking live at Secret Location, but it does um, pan itself out. So the sound does get better. So if you can't hear it every now and again, just bear with it. It will get better. Um, Dennis was lovely. We had a great, great chat um, about his time in musical youth and working with Stevie Wonder and Donna Summer uh, and obviously Pastor Dutchie and all that sort of stuff. Um, what a great guy. Really, really, really lovely chat. I say this about every guest. I, I know I do. If you listen to all of them, I tend to say it all the time because it's true. They're all absolutely lovely and adorable. Anyway, like and subscribe. Um, share the love for the show. Let's get to it. So growing up, what sort of music was in your house? What sort of stuff was around you when you was growing up? Well, obviously reggae. Mm. Uh, Sunday mornings was uh, a bit of Jim Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so when I heard that advert, welcome to my world, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, welcome to my world. Won't you come on in? Wow. Um, so it's Jim Reeves and reggae, and my sisters played a bit of Stevie. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that was their thing. And then um, when did singing like sort of appear in your life? When did you sort of realise you could do it? Or when did you just sing to the records and it came to you naturally? And Actually, yes, it's, that, that's the right thing. I just sang to the... It was Songs in the Key of Life was the, the game changer at eight years old. Wow. I just sat there and poured myself through it and just copied what I heard with Stevie's licks. I just played that album to 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 the to the bit of death. Yeah. Even to this day, I could pick it up and just go, "Wow!" Yeah. And seeing all the musicians that performed on it, mm. um, yeah, it was sung. I, I can actually say it was listening to songs in the key of life. That's it. I said, "You know what? I'd like to sing." But it wasn't a case of I want to be a star. Mm. It was just that I like singing. Yeah. So it wasn't a case. It wasn't anything but that for me. I mean, it's just, just love singing. What an album to start with. It's amazing, isn't it? Every track's amazing. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, alongside uh, Sign of the Times, that's that's an album and a half. That that's you, it, yeah. You know, the body of work is just phenomenal. And then speaking to Stevie about it, don't mean to name drop, but Stevie said he was in a coma mm. and them songs were going around his head. Wow. So he just came out of the coma and went to wrote that album which took him a while that's amazing and it was um i mean it's probably the most heavily sampled album of all time as well isn't it yep probably is <laughs> <laughs> i mean if they're, not, is. if they're not covering the songs they're sampling the hell out of it aren't they it's just one of those you just yeah hear yeah if people don't know what but, we're talking about stevie wonder songs in the key of life which everyone has to have it in the house like you know yeah like frampton comes uh, alive you know <laughs> yeah it's i mean alongside that had the thousand volts of Holt. Oh wow! So yeah. <laughs> that 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 again is just one of them albums that any any West Indian house you went into, it didn't have to be a West Indian house. The, if, the fact if they love reggae back then in the 70s, 72, that album, yeah, seventy three. If you loved your reggae, you had a thousand volts of Holt. That was it. It's great. You know? Funny enough, I, I was listening to it yesterday. I was listening to Help Me Make It Through the Night. I think. He oh did, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, he just. Yeah, I mean, Chris Gascoffson did it, didn't he? Originally, I think. And yes. uh, but he he just smashes it. Yeah. Have you heard Chris Gascoffson's version? Yeah. He yeah. wrote it. Yeah. It's like a uh, take no ribbon from your. Yeah. That's how he sings it. <laughs> and do you know the story behind it? 
No, no, go on. Because I studied this for my, uh, my, my dissertation. Mm. The story behind it was he was a helicopter pilot, helicopter pilot Chris Christopherson. Right. Right. And he was stuck in a storm on an oil rig. He used to fly the, <laughs> the workers from an oil rig. Yeah. And he was stuck in a storm and he thought he wasn't going to get out of the storm. And that's how he wrote, help me make it through the night. That's amazing. <laughs> I know. You, you, you think it's more about a love song, don't you? You do, yeah. But it's not. He's stuck on an, he's stuck on an oil rig. When I, read, when, I was, when I did the research on it, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many different covers of it. Yeah. You know, Gladys Knight does the... the, the John Holt's version for me is the best because that's the first one I heard. Yeah. But then Gladys Knight slowed it down again. Yeah. And then uh, Patti Smith did her version. Mm. So, you know. It sounds like it's one of those songs that you've literally followed the linear path of. Is that, is that true? <laughs> yeah. Well, I said, as I said, I studied it for my dissertation and I got, I think even Elvis did it. Everybody covered it. <laughs> Loads of people covered it. And I was like, wow. But I got four distinct versions. I think I got Patty, Patty Smith. She had a number one with it. Mm. Then I got Gladys Knight. Yeah. Then I got Christopherson's original version. And then I took John Old's version. And all of them are just, when you listen to all four of them side by side, you go, wow. Okay. Yeah. It's a completely different song every yeah. time, isn't it? Like same yes, words, but it's the same words. lyrics. Amazing. I mean, I, like you, I'd take John Holt's version. I think it's with the horns. Yeah, on it. it's, <laughs> <laughs> he makes it like he makes you nod <laughs> to the. Whole song. I'm slightly biased. Yeah, slightly biased. <laughs> slightly biased. Oh, and, and when I do when I do solo gigs on my own, I do perform. Help me make it through the night because I just love singing it. You do. Which which version do you do when you do it solo? Do John Holt's version. You do do. <laughs> What other version would I do? <laughs> That's true, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, yeah. obviously, originally when Musical You started up, you you weren't in the band at the time, were you? You were just a friend no. watching them from the side. Is this right? Well, yeah. This is what, this is how it happened. So, me and Junior were, uh, were best friends, and he said, "Look, you know, I'm learning drums. My brother's Patrick's learning bass, and my dad's putting this band together." And I said, "Do you want a singer?" And he said, "Yeah, we might want a singer." And he said, "Okay." So I went to the very first rehearsal, mm. which was about this time, uh, this time of year, because it was in the summer holidays, 1979. Mm. And I went to the very first rehearsal and uh, I got banned from the second rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> so every day we, they went to rehearsal, I'd follow them to the door mm. and just wait outside yeah. until they'd finish rehearsals. Yeah, for, for 18 months I did that. Wow. So it was... Calvin Grant, Michael Grant, Patrick Wade, yeah. Freddie Junior, yeah. Wade, and Frederick Senior. And wasn't Freddie it? Senior, yeah, that's, that's right. It. Yeah, so you had these four young lads and an older gentleman, like yes, singing. And um, I, I was playing their first track. Uh, is it political in general? Political, yeah, yeah, that's right. And it's a very sort of Steel Panther type song. It's very sort of you know, like politi- well, it was. It's, yeah, the whole thing behind it was um, it was recorded by the Salty Music Workshop a guy named Barry Coleman. And uh, it is what it is. If you remember, it was time of high unemployment. Mm. And uh, the only way out was to play music. So they recorded that single with uh, generals, political and generals with the double A. Right. And I'm sure you know the story because you've probably done your research. But John Holt, picked, not John Holt, John Peel picked up on it. Yeah. They sent it into John Peel and John Peel paid it. And he, he just, he, he championed the band. That's amazing. What a great guy he was. Yeah, amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like you'll never see again. Yeah. Because yeah, they don't allow that kind of stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> so when did the when did the crossover come between you and Freddie Senior? And was it was it a smooth crossover? Was he fine with it? Was it a bit of a bittersweet uh, thing? I can't say it was a smooth... Uh, listen, <laughs> I was 14 and I can't say it was a smooth crossover because I don't think he was very happy that uh, I was taking his job. Right, okay. Um, but uh, the record company just said, look, you need to find a, you need to find a, remember I was at every rehearsal from the time they started. Yeah. And uh, they just said, you need to find a singer young like you guys. And I was the only one who turned up to the audition. <laughs> we I had an anyway. inside track, didn't I? The drummer was my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> so would you, after you've joined, I know they were doing the pub circuit for a little while and talent shows. They and were, stuff. yeah. Yeah, were you, did you get into that sort of pub circuit as well? Or did it, because they were signed at the time almost, did you do a voice no, that stuff? They hadn't got the, they hadn't got the deal yet until right. I joined. And then I had to do, 
from the very goal, I was playing catch up. Mm. But it was easy because obviously Junior being my best friend, I had an inside track on the band. Yeah. So it was it was quite easy to slot in. So from very first rehearsal, we were writing songs together. Yeah. And then um, we, just, I, we just rehearsed seven days a week for me to catch up. I was playing catch up, basically, right. and finding my own feet, so to speak. Because yeah. Freddie was a formidable guitarist and singer. Mm. He had that. I was, I, I had no musical background at the time. Remember, I was just singing to Stevie Wonder songs and yeah. John Alt songs and Jimmy Reeves songs, Jim Reeves songs. So it's like playing catch up and also learning your trade. Yeah. So it was, it was a bit scary. And then Fred, Fred wasn't the easiest of, uh, uh, you know, teachers or, educators in music because he he wanted it his way or no way right I get you know it. so what he was, wasn't easy on us what was his role after you took over did he sort of co-manage was he an overseer or was he well he he helped how can i say he drilled the band you know right he made sure the band was tight no mistakes if you understand what i'm saying yeah and yeah. his boys you know they had to knuckle down and michael and calvin had to knuckle down and when i joined Remember, they're 18 months ahead of me, so I've got to knuckle down and get my head together. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine, like, watching the footage through the week and stuff like that. I can't imagine how tight they could get because they were amazing at their age. I mean, they're just yes. prodigies. They're child prodigies. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. For want of a better word, even I sit back being a member of the band and I, sometimes I catch it. I listen to the first album, which the first album took us two weeks to record. Wow. In total. And... I'm thinking the musicianship is just just phenomenal. Yeah. It, it matches any band that was out there at the time. And I think that's what we wanted to do. We just wanted to be the best we could be. Easy. And just those up. seven days a week helped, really. Yeah, I mean, amazing band. So you're out playing live uh, a lot. What was, yeah. the, what was the reception at the time? Did it go down well? Was it, you know? Well, where we played first. Um, obviously, the first gig I saw was the band supporting the beat mm. at uh, the Powerhouse in Birmingham. So, and then they supported UB40. Mm. So it was, I never saw them with, at the UB40 gig at the Odeon, but I saw them with the beat and it was, I was so impressed because it was a sold out gig. Yeah. Um, I mean, you said we were playing the pub circuits. Yes, we were, but we did a lot of working men's clubs. Right. You know, the West Indian clubs around the country. Um, and my first one was in Cardiff. I'll never forget that gig. <laughs> never, ever. The so while I came out and he was like, <laughs> and at 14, your voice is between that breaking yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, it's the point where choir boys uh, are either, either going to stay or go. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I suppose I had the stomach for it because I came back and did some others. Yeah. But just, just getting, you know, just playing and rehearsing all the time just helped. Yeah. Ease the pressure. Did they, um, and then when it was my... Sorry, on. carry on, sorry. Okay. No, when, when it was my time to step up as the lead singer, mm. fronting the band, it was a lot easier because Fred eased me in, you know. Mm. I don't think, as I say, I don't think he was very happy, but it's what, it's what the record company wanted. When we finally signed, I was the lead singer. Yeah, and playing live, being young guys walking out on stage, did people take you seriously? Was it... Sort of like, you know, is this a wind up or did they instantly go um, into the band? I think once we started playing, because we used to come out one at a time. Mm. So we'd start with the drums, then the bass, then the keyboards, then the guitar. And they'd see the guitar. Calvin picks up the guitar and then look at the size of the guitar, look at the size of Calvin. And you go, <laughs> no way. Yeah. Because I used to help him carry his guitar to rehearsals. The guitar was bigger than him when he started. <laughs> Right, so he stood the guitar up. He was just about just above the height of the guitar, um, and that that just settled everybody down. So once we started playing, people appreciated it more. Nobody ever said, "Come off the stage," or "We think you're rubbish," or whatever. Right. Nobody ever said that. It was only at school they said that when we had a terrible gig, <laughs> oh, and we yeah. did have a terrible gig. I remember that gig. So obviously, you covered. Um the song, I mean, Pastor Dutch is the big song you're known for, isn't it? Yes. And, uh, and yes. it's a cover from the Mighty Diamonds. Um, yeah. You were playing that live for a while, is that right? It, it came from playing live? Yes. Well, what happened was, when we used to rehearse, because we couldn't play our instruments in the house, because we used to go and rehearse in Freddie's house, mm. 
And every weekend we'd listen to the reggae charts and say, see which song we wanted to sing. Yeah. So um, what I did, what we did was um, we chose that song because Pastor Do- Kochi was the number one song at the time. Mm. And what we did was um, we just we just said, right, we need to add something. But we never changed it to Kochi, mm. to Dochi. We just kept with, with, with Kochi. Right. Um, and it was only when, and it, you know, because it was the number one reggae song at the time, people loved it. Yeah. You know. So then what we did was we just kept playing it and we added it to the set because it was, the, you know, we loved the song anyway. Yeah. And then when Calvin added his bits, we never thought anything of it. Yeah. It was only when we did, we did a, we did a, we did a support gig with uh, Culture Club at Heaven, mm. uh, which was the biggest gay club in London at the time. Probably still is now. But anyway, it don't matter. When we performed um, past the Dutchie, there's 3,000 people in the venue were absolutely ballistic. They went nuts. Wow. They went absolutely nuts. And the A&R, the A&R guy, the head of A&R was there from the record company, the MCA. Mm. And he, he said at the gig, he said, look, this song, is there any way you can change the lyric? <laughs> and we said, well, we don't know. Uh, we hadn't recorded, because back then they used to make you demo your album. Right. And we hadn't demoed the album yet. They knew the songs that we performed because they were our originals. Mm. Um, so when we went in, we recorded... That, that the weekend we did the demo for the album, and that was you know we used to do demonstration de- demo tape for for record companies. Yeah. When we recorded the demo, we did two versions of that song. So the the first version was with Kochi, mm-hmm. and the second version was just Dutchy. <laughs> we went back it. Well, all we did was play it back and said, "Well, we're going to change the lyric too." <laughs> and the manager he said, "Look, you know, Kochi Dutchy." And we went, ah, yes, and we jumped up and down like we did. And went, <laughs> right. So all we did was change the lyric. Yeah. When where it says how does it feel when you got no herb, we just changed it to how does it feel when you got no food. That's that right. makes sense then. <laughs> yeah. I mean for the younger people that are listening, like Kutchi's a hash pipe, is that right? Is it a, a form of a hash pipe? a big old bong that the Rastafarians <laughs> smoked. And it, I mean when they smoked it, the plumes are smoking sing. It's just like ridiculous. <laughs> and yeah, but Dutchie's a cooking pot. <laughs> you know, you're talking now, I'm talking about food. The, the, the younger generation now, those of a certain certain, uh, certain uh, area, mm. they would say food. What kind of food you're talking? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so no. Was it... Um, the, the Americans thought we were actually cooking pot. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where the confusion came. And to be, to be fair, it was, it was the Sun newspaper. Yeah. And if you think about the Sun newspaper, they're the ones who, who jumped on it and said, well, this song is about... Uh, 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 about smoking it's about weed and we're like how can it be about weed <laughs> we're 15 14 13 11 how can we be singing about weed <laughs> the fact that we have to go and change the lyric yeah. tells you enough we knew what we were singing about when we were singing the original so yeah. it didn't make any sense <laughs> but I, I suppose that's what's given the song its notoriety and its longevity that's it, yeah. I mean, folk, folk, folklore. The Sun newspaper, that's the most reliable paper ever invented. <laughs> oh, man. Don't, don't start me off on that one. <laughs> yeah. That there's, fact- a, there's an R word that I could put in there and, and then a T on the end. And, uh, you know what? They'll probably deny it. Fant- but, you know. Fantastic chip paper, though, for back in- <laughs> Yeah. It was fantastic chip paper. <laughs> Not that I had chips out of uh, the Sun newspaper. <laughs> Uh, so was um was that um was past the actually from the album when it was released in 82 was it a bolt on or did you plan to put that in the album no no it wasn't a bolt on because remember that was the first single right so back then the single sold the album right so past the dutchy being being as successful as it was because mca didn't expect it to be as successful as it was because we, we we went to uh their they have their big, these big retreats where the, the, the directors and the sales directors and the marketing team all get together. Mm. And they thought that the single was going to go, the single came in at number 86. Yeah. Right. So they didn't think it was going to get any higher than uh, 55. Right. But the week after, and I'm, just to track it back, uh, when we, re- we recorded the single in August 1982. Mm. And, um, when we went back to school in the September, we actually said to each other, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody about the single. Say nothing. Because if it's a flop, they're going to laugh at us. <laughs> right? So that was our attitude. We can't be, 
if it's a flop, say nothing. We just said nothing. And I don't know if you're old enough to remember the charts coming out on a Tuesday. Yeah. Because they came out on a Tuesday. And that the Tuesday after it went to it went to number twenty six, we were actually leaving the school to go and record the album. It's crazy. So we left, went to London to our digs in Ely. And literally a week later, it went to number one. Wow. So it, you know, we'd left the school to go and do uh record the album and it went to number one right after that. That's very safe, the very week. And I remember when we left the school because the charts came out in the afternoon and in the uh, lunch break. We, we, <laughs> what we did was we could hear the the buzz. I mean, the buzz around the school was ridiculous. Yeah, and uh, we didn't have a chance to speak to anybody. We were already gone, and that was was it then. I mean, was it was, was it a crazy experience? You know, being on tour with a band, you're going to be number one, and you're still at school, and you're just you know you you've got two lives. Is it was it a crazy? Well, we never really toured like that because we only worked weekends. But because we were so young, we could only work forty two days a year. But well, this is what they found out after. Right. Um, it was only after we had the hit that the education department came down on us. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know nothing beforehand. Um, but we longed to get back to school, yeah. you know, because it, how can I say? We were in a bubble with each other and spending a lot of time with each other. We didn't have mobile phones like we've got now. Mm. Uh, we didn't have PlayStation games, none of that. Uh, uh, how can I say? Our spare time was spent playing music, talking about music, listening to music. So we consume music like you wouldn't know. Fantastic. We just consumed, consumed, consumed everything. Everything. And how was um, um how was recording the album? Was it a, a joyous process? Was it hard work? Was it a new world for you guys? Was it? Well, no. I mean, bearing in mind, we, we recorded a demo of the album, but it was working with a producer that made it slightly different. Mm. So what he did was just, and if you think about Dutchie, uh, it took us two attempts to try and record Dutchie. The first time in Birmingham never happened. Mm. And the second time, it never, nearly never happened because they, they thought it wasn't going to be a hit anyway. Yeah. So we, we, we nearly never recorded the single. Mm -hmm. So what he did, the original, how, what, how you hear the seven inch single of Past and Lodge, it was recorded. Mm. It was actually recorded. Um, if you, listen, if you w listen to the 12 inch version, that's how it was recorded. And they spliced the tape together. Wow. So the recording process of the album was, was different to the way we did it. Yeah. But we understood it. So what the, what the producer did, he got Junior to play to a click. So anytime he wanted to, if he needed to splice the tape anywhere, yeah. it would be in time all the way through. Wow. Uh, and you, I can see you got a guitar, so you know what I'm talking about. When people have to play to a click, it's pretty precise. That's right, yeah. It, I mean, sometimes... And we, sorry. Go on. I was going to say, sometimes no, right. playing to a click, though, it can take the soul out of the music completely, but you would never it get can the indeed. Vibe. Yeah. But we didn't know any better, Robbie. Yeah. So... <laughs> It was a new, it was a new way for us to record. It's so right. we just recorded, recorded the drums and the bass. And for the album, they, he recorded all of the songs with the drums mm. and the bass first. Then he laid the guitars and the, the keyboards. And I, I did the guide vocal and it was only at the end that I did all the vocals. Right. Wow. So was it, was it instant fame for you when it, when it happened? Did you, um, did you sort of get instantly recognized and apart from the school, obviously, was it everyone else recognizing you in the street and stuff? Was it overnight success or? Uh, no, overnight success. <laughs> obviously in Birmingham. Yeah. I mean, we got, we just went around to our business. Mm. We, you know, when we finally got back to school three weeks later, four weeks later, six weeks later, it was like everybody was whispering, you know, kids being kids, some of them were happy for us. Our friends were happy for us. And some of them were like jealous. But you just take no notice. I mean, that's kids, you know, <laughs> you're 15 and you're that age. They don't care. Yeah. <laughs> we, what we decided was, as a group, mm. we'd say nothing about where we were going. When you listen to tracks uh, like You For Today, Never Gonna Give Up a Heartbreaker, it's like Dutch is the one that doesn't fit. It's really strange. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, you could say that, but not for us. No. It always fitted. Um, obviously, because that's our breakout single. Yeah. And I suppose 
in terms of the lyrics, it wouldn't fit because it wasn't our lyrics. But Heartbreaker, Youth of Today, you know, Never Gonna Give You Up, that's us. Yeah. If you understand what I'm saying, that's our songs. Whereas Dutchy was definitely a cover. Yeah. If you understand what I'm saying. So we wouldn't, we, we as a group wouldn't have been singing about that. <laughs> the only reason why we had to change the lyric is because of the, the lyric of the original song. Yeah. But it's never felt, it's never felt like it wasn't our song. If you know what I'm saying? You know, some people write, perform songs. Mm. There's only one, you know, just by the mere fact the song's 40 years old and nobody's ever got up and said, we're going to cover that song by Music for Youth. Mm, that's true. Because I couldn't do it justice. Yeah. It couldn't do it justice. I'd like, I mean, people have tried. <laughs> you know that's true what was it like working? you released Under Conditional Love with Donna Summer what was it like working with Donna yeah. Summer well that was uh, Donna was absolutely phenomenal um, first and foremost we didn't believe that she wanted to record with us in the first place <laughs> and uh, we stopped off in New York at the Hit Factory and went and recorded went and recorded the uh, track she wasn't there it was her producer right. uh, Michael L. Martin and he was a big he was a Donna had just be, become a Christian Mm. So for her, that song was like, she, she, her career was a bit on the wane, apparently so. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. That's right. Yeah. She'd become a Christian and that song was dear to her heart. Mm. So when they chose us, we knew nothing about it. We knew a bit about Donna Summer, but we're not 70s kids. <laughs> yeah. We're not disco kids. You know, we listen to reggae. Yeah. So we just went and did the vocal. They had the kind of semi-reggae feel to it or Caribbean feel, as they said. And just... You know, went back to, we flew from LA to New York, did the recording, left the recording studio, got on the plane and went back to England. Never thought anything of it. Yeah. That was it. And it appeared on her album, didn't it, as well, which is amazing. Well, it was the song that helped her back in this country. Mm. Uh, and it, it rose to number, I think it was number five. We had two singles. We had 16 and Unconditional Love going up the charts at the same time. Right. So one week it was Unconditional Love, the next week it was 16 <laughs> and so on and so on. So, but it was when we did the live shows with Donna, that's when we really appreciated how big she was as an artist, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Because she was doing sellout. I mean, we had a, we had a gig at the Palace, the Palace in uh, Los Angeles on Sunset and Vine. And we had to come off stage, jump in a limo and have a police escort 50 miles up the motorway to Orange County to do the video, wow. the live video with, with Donna. So wow. we didn't even get to do our own encore. So was 16 a duet as well? Was that right? 16 was a duet with the original The original vocal for 16 was um, jo- uh, Irene Cara. Right. Who'd won the Grammy Award for Best Female Vocal. Mm. But her record company poo-pooed it. Right. So then they got Jodie Watley to go and sing. Wow, from Shadow Yeah. Yes. And the lyrics were written by none other than uh, Lamont Dozier. Of Holland, wow. Dozier, Holland. Wow. So you're basically um, <laughs> chart racing two duets with yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is stupid. <laughs> just stupid. You know, the record company just killed it. <laughs> I mean, a lot, a lot, I, I, well, you know, I've just been researching, obviously, and listening to like, yeah. your stuff. Unconditional Love took a bit of a bashing at the time, didn't it? Is that right to say? It took a bit of a... I don't know. We never looked at any of that. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Like you to know. me, it was um, when I was. If you ask me objectively, what what does it sound like? It's I mean, it's great. Obviously, it sounds a bit like a Disney yeah. track now. If you listen to, <laughs> it, it sounds like Under the Sea, you know, from the Little Mermaid. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I oh, think yeah, yeah. I think they ripped you off, Disney. <laughs> I think you should. <laughs> I think you should. Have I mean, a I've just started. I've actually just put it in the set as a, a medley. Wow, cool. So we put it in the set now as a medley with a uh, sixteen and uh, what you're talking about. Wow, and that was a Stevie Wonder song. Wow, and he wrote that just for you, did he? Or is that one of his... He wrote that for us, yeah. Wow. When we first met, we went, we went down to his radio station and then when we got to meet him at three o'clock in the morning, we uh, actually recorded a demo of that. He said, look, I got this song for you. And he mm. played it to us. That's what he did. That's amazing. And straight away, did you know it was the magic? Straight away. Um. Well, listen, this is Stevie, isn't it? Yeah. Who's going to turn down a song from Stevie Wonder? <laughs> Who's going to turn down a song from Stevie Wonder? That's like turning down a song from Paul McCartney. That's true. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. And you met and both. As bad as, yeah. <laughs> not, well, Michael did. Michael met uh, Paul and Michael at the same time. Wow. Michael, uh, we we spent a day with Michael when we recorded the second album. Wow. We spent a day at um, 
Encino with the family. So Janet, Latoya, Marlon, Randy, Jackie, Tito, their kids. Wow. Um, Jane Fonda came over for the day. That's crazy. All came over. I know. And, yeah, these... and it was when Michael showed us the uh, Motown 25 video before it had been released. Oh, amazing. And you're these five little guys from Birmingham. So, <laughs> I know. I always say that. I, I just go, what? Well, I'm just from Birmingham. That's it. That's <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. Did, yeah. he, did Michael sort of hint he might write a song for you? Was he interested in doing something? No, like he never. But he was he was very warm to us, you know. Yeah. Because he, he kind of, I think they were more interested in the fact that we had an accent. They couldn't, they couldn't get it. Because they're looking at us. And like Latoya and we did a single, we, we did a track for, with Latoya mm. on her album, but the record company said, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and it was almost like the Donna So Much single, wow. same kind of format, but it wasn't as good. <laughs> I, never, I, I can remember the lyrics. I can remember it. No bad, I tried to, um, from what you feel inside of. Oh, I'll tell you what, she was just trying something. Is it ever? Been, yeah. Has it ever been released or bootlegged anywhere? Do you know if there's a copy of it? No, it's been released on her album. It was on there. Yeah, it was on there, but they wouldn't. The record company wouldn't allow them to uh, push it. Oh, I'll get you. I'll get you. It's obviously in the toys. The toys, the toy. <laughs> but no, Michael was absolutely sound. He's always been sound. You know, that's amazing. I mean, yeah, what crazy. And then from that, from eighty five, uh, sorry, eighty four, you walked worked with Eddie yeah. Grant as well, didn't you? Is that right? Yes. So we ended up at uh, Barbados with Eddie uh, because the record company was a bit lost. After the second album, they didn't know what to do with us. And the American label, they don't understand reggae music, so they tried to Americanize us. That's where that all came from. We'd done a summer and whatever. Mm. But they didn't understand what we were about, to be fair. Yeah. And it was a great thought process in terms of Eddie being Eddie. Because Eddie's got lost, they think Eddie's about reggae. Eddie's not about reggae. It is about rock. <laughs> yeah. Electric Avenue. Eddie's a rock. <laughs> yeah. That, he's a rock man. Yeah. And uh, uh, you'd have thought it would have been a match made in heaven. But uh, Eddie was very strict on making sure. We, we, Junior and myself, we spent time writing songs and we wrote some demos and we thought Eddie would have said, right, let me see your songs and let's do this with it. Eddie never did that. Eddie mm-hmm. said, oh, I've got these songs that I've written for you, so let's do these. They were all these songs. <laughs> None of them were ours. And it kind of... As I look back now as an adult, it kind of annoyed me because I, if I was in Eddie's shoes, I'd have said, you know what? These kids are the future, so I need to take them under my wing and look after them and make sure they're all right. But he never did. He yeah. was more like, let's see how much I can get. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect to Eddie, I get it. But as I look back at it now, mm. with an adult's mind and understanding what I understand, it kind of annoys me that he, he knew I was coming. Because Eddie, listen, Eddie was, one of the only artists in the world that owns his own songs. He owns all of them. Does he? So, yeah. Wow. He owns them all, 100%. Wow. And yeah. he's got his brilliant studio. And we went out there and recorded, but Eddie just... <clears throat> I love the man as an artist and a person. He, he's not, it's not, you know, for him it was just pure business. And maybe at the time it was interfering with something else in his life that was going on because he's... You know, Electric Avenue was hitting high and he, I think he was doing something else. But right. as as I said, as I look back on it as an adult, I'd have thought you'd have gone, you know what, boys, let me look out for you. Yeah. But he never did, so. Was, was that, you, you left in 85, is that right? 85 you left the band. I, I, I decided to leave in 85 because I wasn't happy. Yeah. Was that... Was Just that- my... Sorry, I was going to say, was that single on. one of the reasons as well? Was that that record, that experience of doing it? Was that one of the things? No, the single up, wasn't it? one. No, no, no. I wouldn't be so gregarious to say it was the single that caused that. No, I think with the fact that the record company, MCA, struggled now. Mm. You know, they didn't realise they had a gem of a band because mm. the longevity is in the band. Yeah? Yeah. I, 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 I became a Christian and my whole life changed right. before me. And because I wasn't happy... Um, I thought, well, I can't, I can't be in a band if I'm that happy. Mm. And my thought process was, if I leave the band, they get a new lead singer. I wasn't thinking of solo career, none of that. Right. And basically, it was just for me. You know, my mom never said you got to stay. The the lawyers tried to get me to come back and said the band would. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to work like that. That's not how I came into the band. Yeah. You know. So I just made that decision and said I'm stepping aside, and I never looked back, not realizing. Hold on, that's your wage, <laughs> that's your income. <laughs> it wasn't about that for me. It was about my 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 well being. And as I look back on it, 
it was a, the best decision I probably made ever. Yeah, I mean, you were a young guy at the time, and uh, you know, I was at eighteen. Yeah. At eighteen, you think you know everything, don't you? That's right. Yeah, I mean, you may, <laughs> I wish I was that wise at eighteen. <laughs> so was it? After- I wasn't. I was just looking about myself. <laughs> so you've you've left music. You've, is that when you formed your own band? Was it X Y M or X M Y? X M Y. No. XMY was after I'd been to Ireland and toured for six months. <laughs> I toured in Ireland for six months, um, learning my craft. So I was in Southern Ireland, supposed to be on a two-week tour. I ended up staying six months. Wow. And I had all my um, clothes nicked in Dublin. <laughs> yeah. I went to places in Ireland black people never ventured. Wow. You know, places like Glen Cullum Keel, Ballybunion, uh, Wicklow, Waterford, Cork. Wow. Yeah, I did I did a whole of Ireland just doing gigs. And it's mad that three you, months in Dublin. It's mad that you guys were the first black artists on MTV as well. I mean Well, we didn't realise that until after. Crazy. It's only when you look back on it that MTV weren't interviewing a black artist. They never even interviewed Michael Jackson at the time. It's mental. They just played his video. Yeah. So when we went in, we never it wasn't a case of, well, you're the first black artist to be interviewed. It was only as you look back on it that we realised, oh, is that how it goes? Because MTV <laughs> only played rock stuff. Yeah. Did you see... Black um, artists have to... Have you, ever, have you ever seen that footage with David Bowie where he's asking an interviewer why there's no black artists on MTV? <laughs> you, no, I've never seen that. I I've never seen that at all. It, it's amazing. He, and the poor interviewer had no idea this question was coming. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, with Bowie, no, yeah, it's, it's amazing. But you see, if you think about David Bowie, and I've, I've studied, I've read his autobiography, David Bowie wanted to sound black. He did, yeah. You know. Especially young Americans. So, words, yeah. Yes, that's what it was all about because he gave Luther Van Drossi's big chance. He did. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> right, yeah. You can so, even yeah. run the backgrounds, can't you, doing the vocals and stuff. That's Amazing. right. That's, that's it. Brilliant. And um, so when you went solo and released an album in 89, what was that experience like for you? Okay, so when I, when I, went, out, I went out to listen, after Ireland, mm. I came back from Ireland, and I went to see Stevie in concert and my manager at the time, he said, look, why don't you ask Stevie to do a couple of tracks for you? I said, oh, I'll ask him. I asked Stevie and Stevie said, yes. He said, come out to LA and we're recording. I said, oh, wow. Anyway, so I, I got a deal with, I managed to go and, I managed to go and have a meeting with Chris Blackwell. Oh, like right? the head of Island Records for people that don't know. Yeah, the so. owner of Island oh, sorry, Records, the owner, not yeah. the head, the <laughs> owner, <laughs> the man who signed Bob Marley and U2 and Robert Palmer and Grace Jones, all of them, mm. all of them, you know, artists that you look at and you go, wow. Anyway, I sat with Chris and I played him some stuff and he said to me, I was only 20 and he said, what are you going to be doing in five years time? And I said, well, it could be a cross between Stevie and Prince. And he said, that's interesting. What do you want? And we signed a deal, uh, went out to America and funny enough, my manager, when we got out there, he had a heart attack wow. on the 30th of December. He was only 36. So that threw us all into a tiz. And we ended up staying. We were supposed to be there for two weeks with Stevie. Then Stevie got a tumor in his finger. Right. So he couldn't he couldn't do anything. And by the time we'd looked, it was three months down the road and we finally got him to come and do two songs. And we spent a year there, almost a year in LA. Yeah. It's crazy. And I got to I got to go to dinner with uh NWA. Oh wow! Really? I spent two hours. Yeah, I spent two hours with Easy, Dre, Cube, and Mellow. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And what were they? Are they nice guys? Is it all image? They were fine with me. They're actually sad. <laughs> it was funny because I, I'm a musician, so I'm looking for bass, drums, guitar, and whatever. And they're playing SL twelve hundred Mark to, to whatever. That was Dre, <laughs> and it was just like, wow, okay. You'd never, yeah. you'd never put like you know musical youth and WA in the same. No, no, but, <laughs> but. Yeah, I went to dinner with. She, it was a girl named Kim Yui who was head of A&R. She was trying to sign them to Island Records. Right. And they signed to Interscope, but Island got for, for the rest of the world. And uh, she spent the two hours in the Italian restaurant saying, listen, um, what does NWA stand for? And they wouldn't tell her. <laughs> and when we finished the meal, she, they went their way. And then we went, I went with Kim and she said, Dennis, it stands for no whites allowed. I know it stands for no whites allowed. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So, um, I know. So, what are you up to today so, with, your, with your career? You're still singing and you're still on tour. And- just to say, X and Y came about when I came back to England. Mm. 
and I wanted to have a, I wanted to play music, so I put that band together and called it XMY because I thought that was would have been a best name for music, X Musical Youth, but it wasn't X Musical Youth. It was just XMY would have been better than Musical Youth. I didn't understand about marketing and having the brand. It's only now. I mean, I took, I took you know, uh, being the age I was, and I'm 55 now, I don't have a problem being a musical youth. I want to be a youth. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the only 55-year-old who can say I'm an actual youth, you know. <laughs> and uh, people look at me and go, what, you're a musical youth? Uh, look at you, you should be below musical old age. <laughs> so, but now, uh, when I got back together with Michael, I said, look, we need to just, you know, just not shine our light, you know, not keep our light under a bushel. Yeah, you know, it's something we grew up when we left school. We were doing this, so it's like second home. You know, just just get back together. We got back together with Michael. It's so easy. Yeah, you know, because we grew up together. Yeah, you're like our so, brothers. Yeah, you know, we we forty years of forty odd years I've been doing this music, and I'm still one of the youngest from the eighties. That's crazy. I mean, I mean, it's lovely to see your enthusiasm for it still as well. You still clearly love doing it and singing. And yeah, yeah. No, listen, this is this is a mm. listen. Uh, don't get me wrong. There was a time when I didn't want to play. And, and all artists go through it, but my thirst and quench for performing never stopped. That's amazing, yeah. Never stopped. And we recorded uh, Legal Now, which never really took off. And, you know, I, I don't get carried away with, well, it's got to sell this much. Never, never did. Yeah. Just want to record the songs and put them out. So then we did uh, When Rega Was King after I'd studied and studied, studied music at university and got yeah. a master's. And that was the project I put together when Rega was king. So I carried it on. Yeah. And uh, this is the album. That's the last album that we did when Rega was king. And I got it released in America. That's awesome. I mean, <clears throat> I've got to be honest. I think you're probably one of the most underrated voices of the 80s, Dennis. I'm Thank not, you very much. I really do. I think, um, you know, if things have been different, you know, you would have been the loofer of your reggae world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But your, I don't know about that. Your voice, yeah. yeah I mean, I mean I've, I was, I've listened to musical youth you know, a long, for a long time, but yeah. no one else can interview. You. I really dug deep and listened to what I could find around. Yeah. And I just think your voice is just really, really underrated, mate. I just think it's, it's, it's a crime. Appreciate that. It's an absolute That's crime. Pre- I appreciate that. I'm, I'm embarrassed now. No, sorry, You're embarrassing me now. Sorry. But it's just, <laughs> sure. yeah, it's nice to be able to tell you to your face. Yeah. You know, because you know, oh, I, I, I was saying to people that, you know, I was going, um, like they said, are you interviewing? I said, oh, Dennis. And I was saying, oh, this guy's voice is just underrated by miles. It's just, you know, you would blow anybody out of the water, honestly. So Thank you. No, no problem. So you're... Um, Try my best. Try my best not to blow them out of the water. Just do my best. No, oh, well, that's more than <laughs> enough, mate, I tell you. So um, yeah. you're, you and Micah together and you're doing, like, work as musical youth again now, touring and doing bits of... Yeah, work. yeah. I mean, next year, I mean, this year's the 40th anniversary of Dutchie. So we've got some shows coming up uh, in Birmingham. Uh, we've got Hootenannies October 27th in London. Mm. And we're trying to put some more stuff together and then probably, probably roll it through to next year. Because yes. obviously in America, it would be the 40th anniversary there. So we'll move on. I've been doing some 80s shows, 80s festivals. Mm. Um, and yeah, yeah. The way we get treated... I know that most of the 80s artists never got a Grammy nomination, so I just look at them and just start laughing because, <laughs> you know, just, just, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, much the better. So, <laughs> I'm going to keep that one back. <laughs> um, the anthology is on Spotify for people that want to check out um, is, um, yes. music. Um, is it, where's there any place where you can go to get your tour dates? Where's the best place to go for that? Uh, you could get it on Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, It'll all come up soon because my daughter's running all my social media oh, okay. and I'm rubbish at it. <laughs> so she'll sort it out. Um, but yeah, When Reggae Was King is online now. So that's the last album. And we're just about to start the new album with Yet Untitled. That's going to be fantastic. Um, Dennis, we hope. It's been, <laughs> it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you today. Thank you for chatting. Yes, Robbie. It's, it's been absolutely No wonderful. problem. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe and leave us a review. 